most of you might know salmon as an example of a prominent fish species that migrates between freshwater and the open ocean. But did you know that only around 1% of modern fish exhibits this particular behavior called diadromy? Diadromy is an important factor in recent ecosystems, especially regarding nutrient cycling and food webs. So the question arises, if we can identify diadromous species also in the fossil record. Speaking of modern fish species, it's comparatively easy to tell a diadromous ones from non-migrating ones by just observing their behavior. But things get more complicated if we want to look further back in time. We need another approach to determine if an extinct group of fish really migrated or not. Usually we just find small fragments of the skeletons like scales, but inside these scales geochemical information is hidden. So can we use this information to tell more about diadromy in deep time? In my project, I analyzed fossil scales of an extinct group of fish called Thelodons. They were so primitive, they didn't even have jaws or any other bony skeleton. So we call them jawless fish or agnatha. Even without jaws and bones, jawless fish were quite successful and have survived until today in the form of lampreys and hackfish. The most commonly preserved remains of Thelodons are their scales. They can be found in rocks of late Ordovician to late Devonian age around 450 to 360 million years ago. After their origination in the late Ordovician, Thelodons diversified quickly during the Silurian and occupied a wide range of environments, including marine, brackish, and freshwater habitats. Scales of some Thelodons have been found in marine as well as freshwater deposits, suggesting that they might have been diadramas. Freshwater and marine water have very different chemical composition, so if they really lived in different environments, we might be able to tell based on the chemical composition of their scales. But how can geochemistry help us to shed light on thelodont migration? We can use the element strontium as a proxy for the environment an organism inhabited during different life stages. Strontium is taken up in direct proportion to the availability in the surrounding water and substitutes calcium in calcified tissues, such as scales, during the growth of the organism. So, specific strontium concentrations in different environments lead to distinct strontium signatures, which get recorded in the organism's heart tissue. Absolute strontium concentration positively correlates with salinity. This means the higher the salinity, the more strontium. Therefore, stream water has low absolute strontium concentrations and marine water shows high strontium values. This leads to two hypotheses, which I'm testing in the course of my project. Every scientific project should be based on testable as well as falsifiable hypotheses. My first hypothesis relates to fully marine thelodonts. These samples should show high absolute strontium content throughout all their growth stages recorded in their scales, as they spend their whole life in the marine environment with high absolute strontium content. On the other hand, migratory thelodont samples should show a changing pattern in strontium, from low absolute values during their freshwater phase towards higher values during their stay in marine water. The next step of a successful scientific project includes thinking about suitable material and methods to test your hypotheses. Only then you can conduct your measurements, discuss your obtained results, and ultimately accept or reject your hypothesis. However, things unfortunately don't always work out as planned, like in my project when the methods I initially chose were insufficient to answer my question. But before talking about these difficulties, let's just have a look at the material I worked with in my project. I analyzed scales of marine thelodonts as well as proposedly diadromous thelodonts. For this purpose, I prepared vertical sections through these scales to have a look at their internal structure, which shows growth layers. These layers preserve a record of thelodont growth comparable to tree rings and store important information about the entire life history of the individual organism. The scales consist of two types of tissue, animal and dentin. The animal crown is a thin, hypermineralized layer of tissue covering the scales. It forms during the earliest life stage of the thelodont. After its deposition, the scale continues growing inwards by successively adding new layers of dentin, a calcified and quite porous type of tissue. Basically, thelodont scales grow like human teeth. Earlier growth is recorded towards the outside, later growth towards the inside of the scale. In a first attempt to analyze the thelodont growth layers, I used the SEM, 
the scanning electron microscope. The SEM generates an electron beam that interacts with the sample to produce a variety of signals which carry different information. For geochemical analysis, characteristic X-rays are produced through the interaction of the SEM electron beam with the atoms in the sample. X-rays, characterized by specific energies, act as a fingerprint for each element and can be used to geochemically characterize the sample. This technique is called EDX, Energy Dispersive X-ray Spectroscopy. I measured several EDX line transects perpendicularly to the visible growth layers in my marine as well as in my potential diadromas samples. The following graphs show the distribution of strontium in number of counts across the different life stages of the thelodons. In general, all obtained strontium patterns look quite constant. However, if we take a closer look at the corresponding EDX energy spectra, we recognize that background noise is very high. Elements like sodium or chlorine barely rise above background level. The high level of background noise impairs the measurements of less pronounced element peaks like strontium. This is probably because the scales are so porous, they secondarily take up many other elements from the environment. Therefore, I decided not to trust the EDX results and look for a better method. I took my samples to Geomar in Kiel to conduct electron microprobe measurements there. The microprobe works in a comparable way to the SEM. An electron beam interacts with the sample and produces characteristic X-rays. The only difference is how these X-rays get detected. In the case of EDX, the characteristic X-rays are identified based on their energies. In contrast, the microprobe in Kiel uses several WDX, Wavelength Dispersive X-ray Spectroscopy detectors. In this case, it is the wavelength that are used to recognize the characteristic X-rays. This allows for measurements with lower background noise and therefore more accurate quantitative results. I measured some lines of microprobe point measurements on my different marine as well as potential diadrama samples. The microprobe can detect strontium concentrations as low as 300 ppm, but unfortunately this detection limit was still too high for my thelodon scales. However, those few measurements that were above the detection limit were an order of magnitude higher in the marine than in the potential diadromas samples. Most of these points fall into the hypermineralized animal layers towards the outside of the scale, which seems to better preserve the geochemical signal than the porous inner dentine layers. This suggests that the marine samples inhabited environments characterized by higher salinity, which means ocean water, during early growth stages. The proposedly diadromal samples inhabited environments with lower salinity, which means fresh water, during their early growth. These results partly support my hypothesis. However, this is still not enough to answer my question with statistical support. These results made me search for another, more precise method to ultimately answer the questions if thelons were diadromas or not. So, as you see, that's not the end of the story. I'll conduct some further measurements in the following month, and let's just see how they turn out.